we exist to achieve goals and the way we get to those goals. I think that's so relevant to like, even my personal experience of achieving goals. Like I was touching on earlier, like what it took for me to achieve goals. And a lot of those things were not what we would say is healthy or what we would call understanding these ideas Mm -hmm. is not we don't go about it in a healthy way at first. How can we ever know what is if we don't, like you said earlier. And so I think it's, you got to be like super hyper aware of these things, not live, breathe, eat, and, you know, (laughs) sweat them. But like, you have to really understand, like I was saying before, like being so present about the meaning Mm -hmm. behind them. Welcome back or welcome to another episode of Feeding Curiosity. I'm your host, Eric Wenzel, as always. Fitting Curiosity is a podcast that explores the precarity of human experience, and we challenge ourselves and others to think, question, and synthesize wherever our curiosity takes us. It is through conversations like what you're about to hear that we provide blueprints for others to learn and lead a more fulfilling life. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Lindsay Sherwin. Lindsay is a professional actress, youth, and family therapist. She employs therapeutic drama, expressive arts, and counseling techniques to work with adolescents, families, artists, and creative entrepreneurs to solve problems, make new choices, and expand their creativity through all areas of their lives. She continues to train as a registered drama therapist in community mental health. She's worked with several nonprofit organizations based in the United States and Europe to address mental health and behavioral health through expressive arts, specifically through drama and poetry writing. Lindsay is the creator and founder of You Are The Shift LLC, as an expressive arts therapies empowerment-based consulting company and Shift's coaching platform, Shift.it, coaching for artists, actors, and creatives. I really enjoyed this conversation with Lindsay. Talking with a therapist and someone who's trained working with people, you gain a lot of insights around what works and what doesn't. As someone who spends a lot of time reading and listening to therapists from afar, actually listening to one explain how they apply their craft is really eye-opening for me. We talk about creativity and health. We talk about traps and burdens we put on ourselves on providing value. We also get into improving relationships with everyone around us and in how we are always trying to achieve our goals, no matter what we're doing. And I think the biggest takeaway from Lindsay's work and the way she views the world is the power of viewing your own impact on the world. Her company is called You Are The Shift, and I think that's really what it's all about. It's understanding that the impact you make is purely driven by your belief in yourself and being aware of that, basically getting to a point where you can tell someone what you're all about, be as direct about what value you provide to others and the world, and it's very powerful, I think. So with that, everyone, please enjoy this conversation with Lindsay Sherwin. Welcome back to another episode of Feeding Curiosity. On today's episode, we're joined by Lindsay Sherwin. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Eric. Thanks Good for doing this. Here. Yeah, this is really cool to connect after sharing Fritzy's podcast and then you just reaching out just to see if, if this would be an option. And I'd love that. This has been part of the unintended consequences of doing a podcast for me is meeting people who think in similar ways or have interesting stories. So with that, to go ahead and tell us who you are and what do you do? Great. So I am in two fields, actually. I'm in a hybrid, if you will. I'm in the creative arts, performing arts, and mental health. So I'm a behavioral health expert specializing in working with teens and parents so I also practice family therapy. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm also a creative social entrepreneur. I also practice expressive arts therapy and do trainings and provide workshops with the artist community. That's awesome. And one of the things just talking to you and get to know you a little bit was this, where does the background for you and all of this start? So I have been in the performing arts space for a long time. And so I think that through my experiences working with different communities around the world, through performing with those communities, using the arts to help them heal 
through trauma specifically. I didn't know it at the time, but I was just acting. I was just performing. I was doing different creative expressive therapies and I didn't even know it that led me to think of a greater vision for myself and how I can use that intentionally those methods and those Mm -hmm. tools to support people that would benefit from those modalities and so I would act I was a model for some time and then I got out of that and I focused on writing poetry and I've done dance movement so I've dipped into all of these arts and I think the most powerful thing for me was to know that they can be so healing and cathartic Mm -hmm. in a different way. We often express ourselves and and do these arts and take part in them because they're cultural or they're meaningful to us. But I think when I found my way through them, healing my own self, as we all do, subconsciously on a conscious level they added more value because i was using them Mm -hmm. for myself and for others yeah that's really interesting to me because most people i don't think would immediately think that performance like acting or anything on stage would be considered something to, to do with healing but when you start thinking about it a lot of the cultural references at least in you know prehistoric cultures if you think like native americans or even in in Europe or the older cultures, a lot of those have dances and different rituals that could be considered acting if you really think about it. And it, it makes me think of, was there a part of you, what was the part of you that drew, drew you to it at a young age? Because it's, to me, for you to continue that through line into now applying it to therapy work or healing other people through this expressive thing, because I think expressing yourself, especially not just on stage, but just in general, learning to express yourself is something that doesn't come easy to many people. Yeah, I love that point. It shouldn't necessarily come easy when it's used in a way that's not tailored to the person's needs, I think. And that's where the therapeutic part comes in. I continue to do it through the will to want to do it. I had an acting coach who said acting is based on, it's not to push someone to make them do it because they want to be good. I think a lot of actors feel that they want to be the best actor. They want to be noticed and recognized. And that's really what the arts help us to do. And I think intertwining that with wellness and, and what does it mean to be well from my philosophy, creativity is health. If you can be creative You can be healthy because you can be flexible and you can be spontaneous and you can be more than what you thought you could be when you started. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think I continued the journey because there was a a power in that that I wasn't aware of. And I think that's often how we contribute to something meaningful in our lives and, and bigger than ourselves when we're not aware of it and then we be begin to tap into why we're doing it and get the why, the specifics Mm -hmm. of it, that makes it something we want to stick with. Yeah, that's really interesting. And and something you said there hit me with the like expressing yourself in in creativity. But it it really, for me, it was like working out was my gateway into wellness. And I didn't go into it thinking I was going to start doing anything beyond just, oh, I'm just working out now. And then all of a sudden, it the more I got into it, the deeper I went, and that was the slow trajectory into psychology and neuroscience and all of the rest of it. And a famous quote, I actually don't know who was like the first person to say this, but it was the idea around like mental health was to get out of the mind and into the body because we create these thought patterns and these not even like ideas. It's like you create a vision of yourself that when you're just in your own head and it bounces around in there, you just create problems for yourself. But then as soon as you start moving and that could be acting, it could be dancing, it could be going to the gym, it could be running. They're they're all movement of the body that I think is the most essential part. It doesn't matter what you're doing, but as long as you move, that can unlock something within you. And I'm sure you can elaborate much further than I can, but that's like an intuitive sense that I've gained through all of this. Yeah, I absolutely love that, Eric. It's so true. And I was just thinking about 
Jacob Moreno's philosophy, who actually was the founder of what's called psychodrama and the theater of spontaneity. And as someone who practices drama therapy or therapeutic theater, Mm -hmm. um, I was would love to segue into that. I was thinking about how that's so relative to what I practice because this man, he was a psychologist and a doctor actually, but he, so he was practicing medicine and he discovered after Freud, the psyche is actually in the body. So Freud was very much about, if we're talking about psychology and different methods and and approaches to behaviors and, and beingness, that, line of thought was that the psyche is in the mind, our dreams and what we believe and perceive. And that's all like in our subconscious. He said that it's within us. And so when we move, we we can become something else. When we actually move, like you were saying, and get into our body, we can release a lot of stressors, traumas from the past. We can become roles different people Mm -hmm. um, play different roles. And yes, I absolutely agree. I think that the body is integral in healing, but healing is a term that suggests that there's something wrong. And I think we need to think about what it means to be well Mm -hmm. and to be safe and secure within ourself. And that lends itself to so many other aspects of this whole dynamic and complex sphere of what wellness is. And so I'd love to touch on that with you too, in terms of how we are looking at wellness. Wellness is creativity for me, but I also think there's this other side of it that incorporates what it means to be and what it means to execute in our vision, in our dreams, and and that kind of spirituality that comes to it, how Mm -hmm. we're able to do that through these different things, through these approaches. I I think that to be creative is to get there a lot quicker. Yeah. So before we move into the overall wellness category, which I think is really important, personally, I consider it the self-help category because it, mm-hmm. it, with the overabundance of books and myself in particular still have kind of an adverse reaction to probably about 90% of self-help books because a lot of them are disingenuous and come off as snake oil. And that's just my own take on it. And I probably upset a couple hundred people or millions, but whatever. <laughs> to back up before we get there, before I derail us, the I would sure. love to dive into the psychodrama and just give an example for someone so who's maybe not be familiar with that particular category because in our conversation before this, I'd asked you about it and I thought I didn't hear about it, but actually I had. And it's just given a different way of explaining it. Sure. So psychodrama is a method of helping an individual which is called the protagonist in the psychodrama scene, to work through certain situations or troubles or challenges that they've encountered in the past, usually with a family member, or maybe they're grappling with a disorder or something that's Mm -hmm. been harming them. And the way we set it up is we actually have someone like, pick roles from the audience or like people that are in the group. So it is a very much group psychotherapy based method and they can pick people. Those are the players to be the roles of the people in their life or the people in the story, or they could be objects. They could be actual intangible. Like an empty Um, chair. I remember. Yeah. So they can speak to the empty chair, but they also can be like if somebody um, was experiencing like a medical issue, for example, or that they had something that happened to them physically, they can play the parts of their body that affected them and they can speak to those parts. Oh, interesting. See, yeah. That, that It reminds me of, I've done research around PTSD treatments and, and other traumatic life experiences where they did group therapy like this, where they like acted out the events Uh, of it in a circle it was like an entire group of people that was like exposed to the same event and then had them Mm -hmm. do singular and then group therapy and then it was like over time you got to see how their whole emotional response to reliving in quotes those events as it got more and more like easier for them to work through and then another conversation I had was like some of this therapy feels like Drano 
where it's like mm-hmm. slowly over time it like just clears more and more away. I like, yes. thought that was really apt to say because the when you said it's not that something was broken. And I, I think that's part of the, I'll use that as a segue into this overall health and wellness category because I think a lot of people still hold a stigma especially around mental health is that if something is wrong or something's not working it's the thought then is why what's wrong with me I'm there must be something broken and I don't think that's the case I think that's being more harmful to yourself than you than you mean to be or at least in their current frame of mind yes I would say that it's this is an action method. Let me just also establish the grounding for mm-hmm. psychodrama. It's an action method that's used in psychotherapy. So it's not, we're not telling people there's something wrong with you or yeah. you have a problem. We're allowing that person, the protagonist, to name the problem, to be open about it, and to role play and investigate to get underneath it a little bit better so they can clear their mind and get greater insight Mm -hmm. into what's going on. So it even can be like a troubled relationship that needs to be worked through. And that is the essence of a therapeutic resolution. I'm also happy to differentiate between psychodrama and drama therapy. Now I practice drama therapy, but I'm also trained in psychodrama and sociodrama, which is used with groups. So so Uh, those groups have a common issue um, that need to be worked through. But yeah, drama therapy is more of a, an imaginative, expressive arts therapy. Mm-hmm. And it focuses on more just looking at the moment and learning certain behavioral skills to be trained, like mm. through games, through theater. Whereas like psychodrama is more group therapy based. They both can be, but it's you have to do psychodrama in a group. And okay. it's Focusing on, I think we talked about the catharsis, which is basically what you were saying about working it through, getting self-awareness of the problem, having other people play those roles so they can add, they can add intentional insight for that person and behavioral learning. So they're learning to change their behaviors through maybe some of the things they say. It just goes a lot deeper into it than what drama therapy would be used for, which is more like those who might be less higher functioning like that can't get to a point where they can start talking about all these Uh, things in their lives and I think it's very important that we make sure we're able to when we practice these methods we know who we're working with yeah knowing your audience right or knowing the the patient enough to to know what is applicable or not Mm -hmm. I think is really important yeah just a a drama therapy is really to offer like a different view, a different perspective, maybe how to say something different um, to somebody out in the real world. You can use this scene to rehearse it and play it out and practice. So it's again, like practicing a skill, whereas like psychodrama is really, you want the resolution at the end. You never want to leave that undone because it can just unlock a lot of, traumatic memories and experiences so we want to make sure it's it's very safe for that person yeah that makes sense to me it's an interesting how many different layers that can be applied to this even just you know with saying one word it triggered like three or four different types of that at different scales almost (laughs) Mm. unexpected on my end and and one of the things you Mm. mentioned too was is the state of the person is in whether or not they're comfortable with working through however intense the emotion is or whatever the event that may have occurred. And it leads me to think of what I see coming down the line with this pandemic is the extreme social isolation that many of us have been in, especially in my age bracket, which is in the the millennial age group where most of us don't have a lot of friends. And the amount of social contact that we have is very different and limited than generations prior. And so I I keep seeing writings on the wall. I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. But it's a mental health crisis looming. That's the third wave of of this pandemic. Like there's the current situation, the economic situation, and then the mental health situation. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts, and I think this will bridge into the wellness category again, of just what isolation as and like ideas around it in general. I think isolation 
has been on the brim for quite some time just because of technology and how that's like holding people back from being their authentic selves, which kind of aligns with what I do and Mm -hmm. how I help people to become that more and more through expressive arts therapies. I think isolation is really fear. It's unjustified fear because you're afraid of telling somebody how you feel. And so you feel like you, you don't really know maybe why you feel that way, but you have this belief system that you've developed over time mm-hmm. and these patterns and it becomes a habit unless you do it all the time. Everybody wants to just relax sometimes and not pick up their phone or not. And I think that's actually healthy to just turn your phone off. Don't look at it. Don't text, don't call, just do what you have to do and stay mm-hmm. focused on your own goals. But I think when it becomes something of a complex that you are struggling with day in and day out and you want to shut people out, that can obviously lead to mental health disorders like depression, but also an and severe anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder. But aside from that, aside from naming and labeling what can happen as an outcome or as a consequence that affects our health, I think it's just a social issue that has been blown up into this this tragic kind of ideology that people need to be shut out Mm -hmm. and we need to prioritize connection rather than advocate for those who need to communicate their feelings. And I think most people, if not everybody has that need often, some more than others, (laughs) but we need that outlet to continue to do that or we'll get stuck. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And as an engineer myself, I I feel like some of the, in quotes, responsibility of the sins of the past because of how technology has evolved. And even though social media is called social media, it's not very social, is it? Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And um, I I know it's tongue in cheek to put it that way, but I really do agree with that. And I think going forward, I would love to see something, not even just social media, but just community-based things coming back. And, I, and even now it's going to be weird again because people aren't going to want to connect in groups as much going forward. And so it puts us in this catch-22 type scenario where we're social creatures and we need to connect. And connecting via screens, while it's good but it doesn't get you all the way there. Like with the way you connect with, I'm sure you know this, but like connecting via sessions for Zoom or something is like you miss a certain percentage of the body language or the slight delay or even just technical glitches. It doesn't matter what it is. There's, It's still good. It's better than nothing, but it's not like the real thing, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, it can be frustrating too because things happen and you have to adapt and you have to train yourself to be okay with whatever happens Mm -hmm. and accept what comes your way, Mm -hmm. even though the call may have dropped or you have to be okay with that and say, okay, let's just keep going and move on. And that causes all other kinds of things because the person presenting or speaking to you gets flustered and then got to get back on the call and it interrupts their (laughs) train of thought and causes anxiety. And it's just, there's so many cause and effects for it, but there's some good things too about it where you you meet people that you wouldn't normally meet. That's been my experience during this time. Yeah. Personally, I, I try to look for the, you know, silver linings in most things. I think the, our negativity bias as a species is like, a, it shoots ourselves in the foot more often than it should, especially in modern age. And I think if we spent more time saying, how do I make the best of whatever situation uh, you may come your way or have just a little bit of acceptance because we've been circling around creativity and expression. And I think part of the problem for modern people is it feels like it's like this idea of starting on anything. It's, Oh, why should I do whatever it is they feel compelled to do? Because there's a hundred people that have already been doing it. They're better than me. They've got an audience. How am I going to ever compare to them? This comparison effect, this, um, not trusting that you can even, that you, trusting that you'll get better because you look at them and say, I'm not them. So therefore I shouldn't even try. But the thing is when they first started, their first day was however many years ago. And so your first day is now. 
And I'd, I'd love for you to elaborate on like that idea of letting yourself grow. Yeah, I love that concept. Thank you for um, bringing that up. I think that's so critical, especially and essential, really. It, it's at the core of this type of work, mm-hmm. especially in the arts and any type of behavioral health or mental health field where you have to grow through it, especially with the requirements of you know, getting a license or getting a registration. Um, in the stage, I'm still training. Mm-hmm. And so I think to me personally, there's a relevance to that because I really feel like I've had to prove myself over and over again in the last five and a half years that I've been studying this work, um, expressive arts therapies and drama therapy and all the methods that go with it, like we've talked about. And so I think that you will fall into traps. I don't like to say the word fail, but like you will get caught in the middle of situations that you weren't expecting Mm -hmm. that can present a severe challenge that might not even be safe. And you have to take that risk if you want to learn how to persevere and make it through. It's not always ideal. And again, I've had to embark on things or I have chosen to that I wouldn't that I probably wouldn't have chosen now to make those same choices, Mm -hmm. but I did because I wanted to fight for my work and what I can do. We learn, I think through the process and through the journey that you don't have to kill yourself and put a burden on yourself metaphorically on your shoulders to get to where you want to be. But I think especially when you want to be very specific in I prefaced with these fields, it's very difficult to get people to see why they're valuable. Yeah. It's not to say that they can't be done. And then you, you know, you can talk about who you are in this world. Are you a woman? Are you a man? Or are you 20, 25 years experienced? Are you just starting out? What are your qualities and qualifications? Those are subject to people evaluating you. I just want to touch on this too that I know we were talking about this previously, like how do I title myself without being credentialed to practically feel like I can help people and be Mm -hmm. of value who require clinical methods um, to support their health needs? Mm -hmm. Even if the people that are going to be deciding whether I get to do that on the other end realize that I'm able to do that and I'm capable of doing that. That's basically how I got my business into one of the facilities or organizations that I was able to connect with through yeah. working there. That's a whole other topic of how to do that yeah. and how to actually get your goal and your vision and your project into a place, into a physical space, bring it into your, your present reality. But just the process of getting there, like we were saying, I don't see how you can't go through those experiences. But what I will say is on a level of healthy um, measuring of it and healthy kind of reflecting on it, don't judge yourself for not doing everything the right way because we will talk to people and we will come across people that are red flags and we will do things and make choices and decisions and associate with people that will not get us even an inch ahead of where we want to be. Yeah. But we do that and we, and we, we get better for it. That's the way to think about it. I think from my perspective, instead of saying, how could I have done that? I know we have all done that, but Mm -hmm. you've got to, there's, there are ways to help yourself alleviate that, you know, and I can go through that later on and and how to help yourself not do those things and judge yourself. But it's it's twofold, right? It's like a, it's a double-edged sword because it can hurt you, but it also can make you stronger and more resilient in the end. And it, and it has for me. Mm-hmm. So in some way I'm grateful for it. Yeah. I think you, you hit on so many good points there and it, the, the sword analogy I think is perfect because it was what I was actually thinking of. It's I've really come to appreciate this idea of struggle. Oh, it's almost like a necessity of life, right? If we go back to Vic, Victor Frankl, he who has mm. any why can suffer anyhow. And it's, and I think that's hitting on something as, as fundamental as the human experience. It's like, why, like the point of your life is not 
so that like you're happy. It's because you can experience the range of emotions because if it was always good, then it would just, it would just be life. It would just be gray and you wouldn't know if what happiness was because you'd have to be sad to know what happiness was. It sounds weird and mm -hmm. paradoxical, but it's, it's the, through the, the range that you can experience the highs and the lows. And for me, it's like when you can lean into struggle or lean into challenge or difficult situations and accept it for what it was or what it is, not even what it was. Because I think if you reflect too quickly, then you get yourself in, into deeper waters. Uh, different topic, and I'm thinking on my feet right now. But <laughs> I do really enjoy that. And you said the sword thing is perfect with because if you you know over sharpen a sword, then it gets weak or if you spend too much time you have to pull off the the breaks so for me the question then for you would be like specific but how do you respond to difficult situations and it's two parts one is like in the moment to make sure you're prepared and then the other part is if you feel like you're you know obsessing too much or becoming distracted or overwhelmed how do you reel yourself back and, and like unplug for a bit so that you can come back and focus again Hmm. Those are really good questions. And I think they're very involved. I'll try to give the short version <laughs> of them. I think in the moment you need to train yourself and there's ways to do this. It depends on how one would like to do it. You need to train yourself on how to cater your spontaneity to what somebody is saying to you and know how to shut it down when it needs to be shut down. And what I mean by shut down is not yourself and not deal with the situation or address it, but dismantle it in a way that asserts yourself. So this is where like skills come in, right? That's why I'm so obsessed with skill training because it's critical, like for everybody, not just those with specific needs that haven't had the um, luxury, the opportunity to learn skills, like how to be assertive and how to communicate effectively or how to resolve conflict, but how to look at what somebody is saying to you. And this is based in psychology, right? And decipher what is needed here in this moment and different things are needed in different situations and the way you realize how to do that or how to speak to that so quickly and this is something that i've had to actually personally learn i think it's one of the most interesting aspects or elements of psychology that drew me to it is like how do i know what to say it really oh. distills it down to its essence and we don't always know what to say like we're people we're human beings we're mm -hmm. going to say what we feel and we're going to be in the moment and and if we need to curse if we need to yell if we need to scream like we're emotional creatures especially if you've trained in the acting method of Meisner and right that fourth wall like you don't believe anything else exists and you can just say whatever you want because mm -hmm. that's like letting your guard down and tapping into your intuition but in real life that's why acting and, and life are so complementary to each other and there's like this dichotomy but they're two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. not to get off track here but I think that it, it takes a skill to be able to do that Acting mm -hmm. can help you do that it be, because of the repetition and getting in the, the mode of responding. But the skill training, that other piece of it, is how you learn how to say what you need to say. Mm -hmm. And the other aspect or element of your question you were saying about... Like overwhelm. Like how do you overwhelming. Like backpedal okay. or, or release any tension or stress you may be building up? Yeah, if you don't address it quickly. What I found helped me to address those things and to relieve that overwhelm in me is to write about it. I'm also a poet. And so I write a lot of poetry mm -hmm. and in short little narratives as well. And one of the methods I use, which I've been trained in, people do this anyway as suggestions, even though they're not trained in it, but they know that and they're familiar with this process of scripting and so I've actually looked at this process of, of revision. It's okay. called like revision or rescripting. It's very big in the psychotherapy world, but I actually developed a version of it where, for example, like if you do this with clients, you can have them write an old script, mm -hmm. like their old script or things that they say to themselves or lines uh, that they okay. say. I pick out, I help them pick out lines that they say 
to like members in their family or to people that they're having difficulty with. And then we like reverse those lines. We say them in the way that we want to say them. Yeah. How do you want to say that to your mom? Or how do you want to say that to this person? It's like, they say a um, sentence all the time that rubs the family member or someone close to them the wrong way or derails the conversation. Is it like that kind of thing? Yeah, it's really like breaking down those limitations on yourself. And so if you weren't to do it with a client, but if you were to do it with you know, your own self and maybe you're unhappy, let's just focus on the individual for a second. Say it's not, we're not, I believe everything is relational, but say you're not grappling with somebody at the moment. Usually we all are, we all have issues and we're dealing with certain things and people. And those are really what gives us, I think the most strife in life is like that relational dynamic. It's not really experiences. It's the people in them that we're talking to and that we're trying to work our way through with those people our own issues we're working through our own issues with people yeah and your relationship to yourself (laughs) what's that the relationship to yourself too (laughs) right exactly yeah and so you can go back inside yourself and like we were saying to dismiss um this idea of i need to change myself but i think of it i want to just reduce this overwhelming feeling that is giving me when i think about this situation because the thoughts are very critical to how we we manage and how we cope and so i would just like i would just take it through like a more again like psychodramatic way of you can write a letter and you can say say you had a conversation with somebody don't even worry about that person Mm -hmm. think of the conversation in your own mind write it out or write parts of it that you've had or even look at it on a screen if it's in a text or an email and it disturbs you and you're and you're ruminating about it you can actually address everything you've said to yourself i remember for example i was telling someone like this is not working for me i want a harmonious relationship i want to feel like somebody is understanding me and that i'm valued tell yourself that I want to feel like I and your name Mm -hmm. is valued, is harmonious. You, and then you can even address it. Your name valued. You are, you are harmony. You are loved here. And you're just talking to yourself while that other person is saying whatever they're saying. Like you're just reversing the lines. Mm -hmm. So that it's about you telling those lines to somebody you're saying, you know, you're saying them in a different way. Yeah, is you're telling yourself what you really want, even though you you've been afraid to tell you yourself what those were, or mm-hmm. something like that's so interesting. I was I'm really curious. I might have to do some writing and see where that goes because that's that yeah. sounds really interesting. I, I haven't heard it explained that way. I, I've heard things that are similar to that before, but not that specifically. I think that's really interesting. I tried it, and again, I didn't get this word for word from people who have experimented with rescripting I just tried it on my own with what I feel would work but Mm -hmm. I think through my exercises with some of my clients I think especially those who have relational issues Mm -hmm. um with the loved one like an intimate partner if it's a couple I think it's really good even just writing a poem before Mm -hmm. we start talking and then writing a poem after and seeing like how, how they feel how the words change and stuff like that yeah yeah that's yeah what are they gonna say then yeah that's super interesting so i would love for you to explain your views as like the world is relational or the world is interpersonal mm. because i really i've been reading a book from the psychologist or based off the psychology of alfred adler and his, okay yeah so his, his psychology his it's now called individual psychology. I've been reading the book and I, I have been like, wow, I've, this is like how I think. It's really weird. And so I would just love to hear you explain it because I've never heard of his psychology until very recently. But it's like almost exists as like like how we almost talk sometimes It's it, or in certain parts. Yeah, he's really interested from my reading on him too in the personality mm-hmm. and how we develop our personalities. I think there's a quote by him. I'm just going to find it here that I have. Okay. Trust only movement. Life happens at the level of events, not of words. Trust movement. Mm -hmm. When he's, I think he, what he means by that, because you can take all of his quotes and relate it to people and human behavior. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's what we are physically being in the moment. And it's how we are relating to people in the here and now. And that is a big concept in present day, like psychology. 
And he looked at that, I think, a little bit more intensely. And so I think also his insight into how we relate to people in our family and the family of origin is very interesting as well. I don't know if you've read more about that, but I think that in terms of his human behavior method, or I don't want to call it a method, but like his beliefs on that, it's really motivated by what's called striving Mm -hmm. to be superior, to be more. The superiority complex or inferiority complex is the like Uh, terms that he uses. Exactly. And like these natural and healthy reactions to what we feel when we feel inferior to someone Mm -hmm. Um, and that we're really just here. We exist to achieve goals and the way we get to those goals. I think that's so relevant to like even my personal experience of achieving goals. Like I was touching on earlier, like what it took for me to achieve goals. And a lot of those things were not what we would say is healthy or what we would call understanding these ideas Mm -hmm. is not we don't go about it in a healthy way at first, yeah. but like, how can we, how can we ever know what is if we don't, like you said earlier. And so I think it's, you got to be like super hyper aware of these things, not live, breathe, eat, and you know <laughs> sweat them. But like, you have to really understand, like I was saying before, like being so present about the meaning mm-hmm. behind them that will allow you to trust like he was talking about trusting the movement i think that's also about trusting your body Mm -hmm. when something doesn't feel right as well as your mind and what you're saying all very interesting to me and i'm not done with the book yet but i'm definitely going to be diving in more and it's interesting to just hear it from someone who's been exposed to it more because I, i haven't heard of it until very recently so it's interesting just to hear you elaborate on it for me And I think now was probably a great segue for the like just overall wellness category, because as a psychologist and coach, that term, even entrepreneur itself gets thrown around just as much Mm. as coach nowadays, especially on social media where people aren't fact checking or credential checking or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Because if you Mm -hmm. look a certain way and you put up a video that makes it look like what you're doing, people can believe you. Exactly. And that it. Is it the fault of the consumer? Maybe. Is it the fault of the person? Probably more, in my opinion, because I think if you have access to a platform or access to information, you should be using it in the most responsible form possible. It's core to who I am. For me, it's it, any sort of knowledge you gain is should be used responsibly and not to ill gains on other people or in a less than uh, respectful way. So I would just love to hear your take on it as someone who's specifically trained for this. I think that, well, first of all, I absolutely agree with that. I really do because I think everything becomes personal because it's your personal experience with learning a subject or a specific area of expertise. And I think if you take that seriously as a professional person, it begins to draw your attention to when people are not using it responsibly. You start to hone in on what people are doing as you become more attuned to your craft and you start to look at, is this person saying the things that I am aware of through my training? And and maybe they're adding something new. Like I'm not um, downplaying what people say because sometimes like people do learn from their own experiences and they're able to offer Mm -hmm. that value to someone who is struggling and and they need someone they, or they believe they need someone who that helps them Mm -hmm. to feel better when somebody brings their story to the forefront and maybe writes a book about being harmed or something that's very, something that's very deep seated to them. But that is a psychological trauma. And that person, that kind of little analogy leads me into explaining that if that is the case, usually people write books about terrible things that they've had to overcome or challenges or living on the streets and then becoming like rich and able to, to do all these things now that person is resonating with their story, but they still have a psychological trauma that they experienced. And I think that should be addressed and and managed by a professional. It can, it's an additive bonus to be able to watch someone speak about or listen to somebody speak about what they've experienced and what they've gone through, but that doesn't mean it should replace treatment if that person needs it. 
they have a psychological trauma or something that's um, considered a diagnosis according to a professional provider, they should get that looked at. And I think that in our society, especially in this country, we, we inflate issues that are not necessarily needed to be inflated and we downgrade situations or circumstances for people and for groups of people that should be more should be more emphasized as something like critical to to well-being Mm -hmm. and i also think what people are telling you to do in their advertising or in their videos can cause more harm than good sometimes you can't say at least in new york state you can't say you're doing therapy if you're not credentialed to do therapy Mm -hmm. certain states are different though and everybody can call themselves a coach anybody and everybody can say i'm a coach Hmm. it's just not like a licensed profession at this point it's like how do we use my question would be how do we use if we're in the arts Mm -hmm. and we're like using arts in a clinical setting, which I do, Mm -hmm. how do we use art and creativity to heal effectively Mm -hmm. if we're not really trained to do that? Now, a lot of people use art, they use creative methods. And when I say creative methods, I don't mean just using something creatively. I'm saying like actual artwork, using the arts. Yeah. Drawing or expressing the body in some, yeah dance, drama, these modalities, writing, these all can be translated into a therapeutic application. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they're not. And people are saying, like, I was just looking up, someone um, said that they created a nonprofit. It's about art and creative therapy. They're saying, we're doing creative therapy. You're not trained to do that. So you're, and then you're listing on your website that you're, you're helping young people Mm -hmm or, you know, vulnerable youth using these mediums like photography and employment and it's all scattered and all over the place. What are you doing? How are you really helping people? I think it's part of it is how we name what we're doing. Yeah. Um, Is it, would you say it's like a vision problem? Like they haven't figured out how to (laughs) like communicate what it is that they're even attempting to do. Like they're on, so, like, yeah. like it's like they're onto something, but it's not like they haven't done enough work to to really create a good found, foundation for it. At least that's what it sounds like to me. Uh, so yeah, I agree with that. No, that's what it is, and I think it's also like in the in the macro level of thinking, it's really like those organizations are very grassroots, and they're not being. Mm-hmm really looked at or recognized through a greater lens of like funders and like people who are like really going to be like implementing this, like scaling this. And I'm more interested in, in looking at my work in the potential to be on that level. So it's like where you are in the space, I think too. Right, yeah. um, I've met a lot of those people and I, through my journey and that was part of my journey, like meeting people that don't align with what I want to do. Right. Because that's where you fall into this trap of they're not even ethically doing it for mm-hmm. one, and they don't even know how to speak to it. So you've got to move away from that and be, be with a cohort of people that are professionally trained, because that's how you're going to learn. And it's going to show, it's going to show yeah. through because sooner or later, I think what we're saying here is that they can do all these things and, and they can say what they're doing and what they're not doing and make it up or whatever they're telling you that they do. But it's going to show through in their marketing and, and people that really know what they're doing are not going to. So it's, they'll be there. They'll stay there, but they'll be at like a kind of a underground level. Yeah, Maybe definitely. that's where they want to be. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And, and you really you have hit, to choose. Yeah. And you really hit on something. I think that I think it's important. And it's really important for me, but just being ethical. Most doctoral practices or anything that requires working with patients, you have to know ethics and you take a code yeah, and you take a code usually where you do no harm or something along those lines, or at least bars you from saying certain things or working with certain kinds of patients. For instance, if you are getting certified as a nutrition coach, not a, not a nutritionist or a dietitian, you cannot work with people who have diabetic illnesses or any sort of eating disorders. You have to refer them to someone else. You can only help general case stuff. And, and so for me, it's, it's really interesting to, to hear things like that because I think understanding where the limits are of what you can say to other people or Mm -hmm. with 
good conscience is I think the most important thing. We're so, it's so easy just to share information to people now that it might, like you said, might do more harm than good. Like I think advertisement is a great example of that. It's because when you see an advertisement for a product or something, it's like what it's saying is signaling to you people like this use X or wear Y or wear mm-hmm. this or, and it's so, it's like subliminally yeah. messaging you to say, Oh, don't you want to be like them and whoever they are? And <laughs> I, I think it's interesting to, to think about that. And it, I think honestly, in the time of this pandemic too, I, th- the idea of good decision-making with ethical, what affects the many, that kind of framework is really coming to the forefront. At least for me, it is because it's like, what it does it take to be a good leader and and good leaders kn- know when to say they don't have all the answers. Good leaders know that the decisions they make are going to be negative to a certain percentage of the people that they're serving but also they have to still make the best decision with the current information, but it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing. But what we really need in my opinion is more people being aware, like at least vocalizing that awareness to say, this is what we're working with and we are doing the best we can, but we're going to change our, change the plan as we get new information. And I don't see a lot of that and it drives me crazy. (laughs) Yeah, I think, especially in mental health and behavioral health, mm-hmm. I think those those two lines of work or disciplines are very tricky within the general wellness space mm-hmm. because they are more intentional. We're not saying that we're just going to help mm-hmm. feel better as a person and develop yourself. That's really like personal development, which I've looked at and I think is very helpful when you commit I think this is a key word for me when I look at this topic. When you commit to doing that as a professional person day in and day out, you're really looking at the field of healing work. Mm. And that can be done in many ways. People do Reiki healing, body massage and massage therapy and hypnosis and different Different. approaches. Yeah, there's so many. It depends, I think, on what you're saying that you're doing too. Yeah, Like what you're saying that you're doing for people is imperative because that kind of alludes to how you're going to help them. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about behavioral change, like I talk about behavioral change Mm -hmm. through innovation, through a creative, innovative way of, of helping people resolve their problems, their interpersonal problems, their relational problems, their own personal issues versus just offering a way to help. I think that's what they're doing. Uh, They're offering a way to help. Yeah. That's a really, it's like the going down to the root cause instead of, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you fix a symptom, not the actual problem. Right. Yeah. That's what it was. It just clicked. (laughs) I really like that. If it really worked, you wouldn't have to keep doing it unless it's something that just helps you in the moment, like something like working out or, something like that. Those are mm-hmm. things that daily practices that are good or even meditation, right? Like meditation costs nothing or it doesn't have to cost anything. And mm-hmm. you, so you mm-hmm. can do that and it, it's, it'll help you over the long term if you keep up with it. And, and same thing with eating a good diet. But if you have an underlying problem that needs to solve, I like to think of things as like knots or something like that. You have to untie mm-hmm. the knot mm-hmm. and then you'll get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I really think inwardly, Everybody has more complex things going on Mm -hmm. than the qualities that they're attempting to resolve. So we all have specific qualities within ourselves that we might want to improve or that we want to polish and get better at and have better qualities of of those same ones. Like we want to be more approachable. We want to speak better. We want to socialize more playfully, but that's what people should be talking about if that's what they're doing for those people they're not actually helping you like change your whole life so why are they saying that so that kind of gets back to differentiating what you do and people get unfortunately very sucked in by that and but there are I think it depends on how you do it I'm finding a lot of artist clients now that want to work with me because they realize like they and that's part of my job too to help them realize and lead them down that path of you're not going to find sustainable work if you don't deal with and address the root causes of what is 
keeping you from talking to somebody a certain mm. way to get what you want or yeah. to express yourself in this way to your partner. That's interesting. So is it like working with artists who are already like trying to become successful financially? Is that what it is? Yeah. Because I Yeah, several of them want to be actors, professional actors. Okay, yeah. As a career actor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting to me because everyone that the stereotype of the starving artist or the person who mm-hmm. or, or even just the painter type who who maybe re- really loves creating and doing stuff but doesn't know how to turn it into a business or create a functional yeah. thing because they just they're such a in quotes free spirit that they don't mm-hmm. want to do that legwork to create a sust- sustainable thing to do the thing that they actually love and I, yeah I that's it yeah it's a really interesting concept because when you first said it I was thinking like creative plateau but it's like a rounding out the personality and more than anything else <laughs> Mm-hmm. That's it's it, helping them to find a different way of sharing their story mm-hmm. in a way that they can talk about what something means to them without going through, okay, a lot of coaching. If we're, we're talking about addressing this, where someone would need to tell somebody about it, not mm-hmm. just talking to themselves, but they acknowledge that they're at the point where it's, okay, I need to talk to somebody to get me there. When yeah. you talk to a coach, you're, you're saying, I'm here, I'm at A, and I want to get to B. Well, it's more like A to B to C to D, like the way you get to those steps is knowing what is behind them. I think we're, especially in the social media world, jumping steps is very common. (laughs) Yeah. Like you'll be given step A or you'll be given step A and then you'll get M and then Z or something, but they don't tell you the in-between steps. So it looks like you got the full thing, but you don't you have 5% of it. <laughs> it's That's a really interesting take on it. And one of the questions that kind of just came up for me is, is like this idea, either a young person who might be just getting out of college or someone who's looking to like shift, maybe mm-hmm. this pandemic, they're, they're off of a job and they just, now this is a perfect time for me to reinvent myself, however that may be for them. What would you say to someone who's just starting out in whatever category to take those first steps? I think that the most important thing, especially if you've just newly graduated during this very difficult time of navigating the world, it does have a silver lining. I think more people are available to want to help now because they're more limited in Mm -hmm. what they can do for themselves because they have to stay at home and they can't go to their office and they have, you know, less meetings and Mm -hmm. they're just, I've had that actually happen to me where people are like, I'm more available to talk now. Like I want to help. I want to give back because Mm -hmm. I found myself being really too much a part of my own self and not to say that they felt that they were not willing to give back or open to to supporting them but it's just I think this crisis has opened people's minds up to the availability to support people and Mm -hmm. to be more empathetic but I would say I would say that there's two ways to do it it's to be very practical about what you want to do and find someone who is willing to work with you to build those skills. I think empathy and resilience are two of the main skills that I work with when I help people. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, I I read a lot about those those two skills Mm -hmm. and what they mean, but finding others and that includes and involves networking and really putting yourself out there to learn about what it is that you need to get to where you want to be. Like, what are the personalities of the people that you're going to be encountering? Who are you looking to communicate with on a different level than maybe you have been when you were in college? When I was studying, I was always reaching out to people. I was always networking. Mm -hmm. And that could also be an issue too. Like we were talking about before, like making sure you're talking to the right people. I would talk to anybody and everybody whoever would listen to my ideas. And that was also what one very temporary mentor, because I realized too, like he wasn't the right person. Like even some mentors that say that they've gotten it all figured out, like they're not good for you either. Mm -hmm. This person said, you got to eliminate the voices. That stayed with me though, like getting rid of the voices because the voices, meaning the people 
that are around you saying things to you, different things, like you got to do it this way. Even my own family would say, okay, like this is the way you have to do it. And the way they would present that was not constructive. And I think a lot of parents with their young kids, and I'm saying kids, like when you're 20 and 21, like out of school, you are still like a young kid. Yeah. (laughs) And, And I think the way parents and families present that to their children or their young adult, I don't want to say young kid, but young adult, which maybe developmentally, they are a young kid depending on their experiences Mm -hmm. and their background, their socioeconomic background, that's going to inform how they socialize and how they meet people and talk to people. And so I think that was something I had to learn. And, you know, I was always told like, no, you have to do it this way. Like, why are you going after all these people? They can't help you. They can't do nothing for you. And there's nothing that's going to come of it. And I think about it and I'm like, yeah, some of them, that was true. Like my family was right. Like I shouldn't be, but like I had to learn that. And so they're going to have to learn. I would say you, you should try it out. You should discover what works for you, but you should also, because you won't know unless you do that, but you should really also do the research and work in the field. If you can get a job in a field that you're passionate about or that you want to learn more about, that you want to you think you want to grow in, I'm not suggesting people should just get a job in anything just to pass the time, but develop some passion mm-hmm. for that within something you're really interested in or really empowered to be a part of and really deeply interested in that you think you can grow in and you see yourself growing in. And then talk to those people and then find the the right people in that field to get you there. And that will take practice and time because it took me years to find like what I consider to be the healthy, right people that yeah. can are literally going to support me, not just leave me or leave me astray and lead me. It was good that they left me, but lead me <laughs> to like dirty water, yeah. you know? It's really interesting. I feel like one of the most dangerous devices anybody can give, and and I think parents are really bad at this unintentionally. They mean it good. They mean it with good intentions, but like they say, you know what you should do? They always do that. It's like that you should do X. It's more of like they're projecting what they thought they should have done at your age. And they're like making up for lost time with their children. I definitely was, and this is no dig on my own parents, but my dad would say mm-hmm. the same thing to me. He would tell me, so you should go just get a business degree and do that. And I'm like, dad, that does not know. Like you can't yeah. do, you can't just go get a business degree now because those are, everyone went to, in the early nineties, everyone went to go get a business degree. So when I, by the time I got to college, the, the mm-hmm. oversaturation of a business degree might as well meant nothing. <laughs> the Searching internally, for me is huge. Like figuring out what it is. It's like discovering who you are. And I'm curious if you have a vision for yourself or some sort of personal philosophy that you use to, that is like an anchor for who you are. Cause you've said a lot of words around like visions and around like creativity and performance and expression. So I'm, I'm curious if you have something like that. Yeah, I guess this would be a good time to draw from some quotes Mm -hmm. to share with those listening what has helped me process the challenges that have led me to my greater vision, who have added to my empowerment and kind of my passion for what I do. And when I say passion, I mean like passion over time, because I think it's really difficult to just become impassioned about something. I think you really have to learn what it means to have passion through doing it because maybe you don't want to do it anymore. You don't want to work with the people that you're working with or who you're serving. I would say I actually wrote my own quote, but then I can share another one. Mm -hmm. So this is something I said, I'm not sure when I said it, but I like it. The internal creative power that I choose to embody precedes intentional effort to create confident external results. And that makes up my life. So just to break it down, what that means to me is, and a lot of what I do is through embodiment, like we were talking about before, movement and intentionality and creation, deliberate creation of results, that has helped me to see why things are working now when they weren't before. And I think that's our process, right? Things are not working at this point, and so we need to change something to get them working again. Like we're never finished. Mm -hmm. The chapter might be closed in the book. 
but that's not, we can erase that chapter. Like we can tear that chapter out. I'm not saying we should abolish every memory of it, but we, we don't have to keep it present in our mind if we continue to change how the body reacts, what we say, summing up basically what we were talking about before, the beliefs and, and the thoughts that entertain our mind. I think something George Bernard Shaw said, who I really like too, people are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, make them. So he's really saying, instead of competing, we're creating for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. It's so good. And it's, I really find when you can say what it is that you're all about in as few of words as possible, really it, to me, it's like an anchoring thing where it it's how you express yourself in, in all things, right? It's once you figure that out, then you can understand the direction where you're going to be going for the foreseeable future. And I, I just really appreciate that. And we've, we're just over an hour already and we could keep going for many more hours at this rate, <laughs> but I want to be respectful of your time. And I really appreciate all of that you shared so far. And I'm sure there's much more. And so for the last thing is where can people connect with you? Sure. Yeah. So you can find me um, at my website, www.youaretheshift.org. You can also email me directly at Lindsay at createyourshift.com. And if you want to look at more of my artist work, you can find me on Instagram. I have a different name, but that's Lana Evolved. Cool. I will have links on the webpage for all of that stuff too. So when people want to go find it, and if you want to throw on a poem or something like that on there too, if is whatever you want to do, throw on there, we can do that. So Great. thanks for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.